Now, when he joined the governor, uh, they were looking, governors of all the states were looking for eminent persons who had the ability to, uh, to uh, recruit a thousand men in a regiment. So he offered Chamberlain a colonelcy. And I'm sure the governor was surprised when Chamberlain said, no, I have to turn that down. I don't deserve a colonelcy. I don't have any military training. He said, I will start at a lower rank. And then in this wonderful words, he said to the governor, I want to learn and earn my way to a higher rank. So he starts out under another great main figure, as it turns out, Adelbert Ames, who's 26 years old, a graduate of West Point. Ames takes over the 20th Maine leadership and the men hate him because he's a strict disciplinarian. Some of them write, they hope he will be the first casualty when they face the Confederates. But Chamberlain did not hate him. They're seven years older than Ames. He knows he has a lot to learn about military discipline, military strategy. So the teacher becomes the learner. And again, I think that says a lot about him. He's willing to be the learner, knowing what he does not know. Hi, everyone. This is A.J. Woodhams, host of the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war-related topics. Today, I am extremely excited to have on the show Ronald C. White for his new book, On Great Fields, The Life and Unlikely Heroism of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Ron is the New York Times bestselling author of biographies A. Lincoln and American Ulysses as well as three other books on Lincoln, most recently Lincoln in Private. White earned his PhD at Princeton, has lectured at the White House, and has spoken about Lincoln across the world. He is a senior fellow of the Trinity Forum in Washington, D.C. Ron, how are you doing today? Hey, Jay, thank you so much for inviting me to participate with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, So excited to have you on the show. So excited that uh, you wrote this book. We were talking before we we got going here. I was a big fan of your last book about Ulysses S. Grant, American Ulysses. And I've got this. So I listened to the audio version of that, and it was in my car when I was listening to it. And I'm here on the outskirts of Washington, D.C., but my family actually lives in Indiana. And I was listening to your book on that trip. And I don't know why this is stuck in my mind for several years now, but every time I make that drive, I think about your book because it's just like the associations with the landmarks and, you know, this is where you were writing about this particular thing in Grant's life. So yeah, I thought I would, I would share that, that tidbit. Um, But I was also listening to the audio version of this, which is different than the audio version of your last one, because you yourself narrated it, correct? I had to rally for that. Uh, Often, as you well know it, There's a group of professionals that do this. And I said, I would like to do this. I think audiences, readers like, if they possible, to have the author be the narrator. Oh, you're absolutely right. I will always, I was really excited when I saw that. I will always gravitate towards audiobooks that are narrated by the person who wrote the book. Um, And it just so happens that you've got a great voice for audio narration. So second time around, you were actually in my car on the trip uh, this last, over, over Thanksgiving, actually. Except it was your voice to your words instead of somebody else's voice to your words. Well, yeah, well, we're talking today about um, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and and your new book. Uh, First question I like guests to start off answering on this show is, if in your own words, could you just tell us what is your book about? Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain was rediscovered in the novel Killer Angels in the Ken Burns Civil War documentary and played by Jeff Daniels in the movie Gettysburg. And it's been a wonderful rediscovery, but it's been what I call a zoom lens. It's focused almost exclusively on Gettysburg and the Civil War. I wanted to provide a wide angle lens. Chamberlain does so many different things. He has so many other vocations, uh, professor, uh, governor, college president, amazing lecturer, and great writer. We need to hear the wider angle story of Chamberlain. Yeah. And your, so your other books are about huge figures in American history, Lincoln, Grant. 
I wouldn't I wouldn't say Chamberlain is is an obscure figure. Um, he's definitely less well known than mm-hmm. than Grant or Lincoln. Yeah. Why did you choose to to write about him? Well, when you speak about someone, I was speaking about Ulysses S. Grant at the Jonathan Club in Los Angeles in the spring of 2016, and everybody, someone will always ask, and what is your next book? And I said, well, I didn't want to be flippant, but I said, well, I'm not really sure. Does anybody have any ideas? I don't think I've ever said that. And this fellow in the back of the room stood up and literally shouted, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. And I sort of said, oh. So then I checked with my editor, agent, publisher, and my goodness, with all of the fame in one sense, there had not been a full-blown biography, perhaps never a full-blown biography of his total life and his total accomplishments. That's how it came about. Yeah. Well, you know, let's let's just kind of dive right into to his life, starting at, at the beginning. So it just maybe start off talking about you know, his upbringing. What kind of home did he grow up in? You know, what, what was he doing before the war? Um, what, what were his pre-war years like? Well, one of my convictions is that often biographies skip too quickly over the young person's life what I call the formative period of a person's life. And I say to audiences, think of your own lives. You might be 40, 60, 70, but when you were 16, 18, 20, 22, weren't those the years that often the basic values or beliefs of your life was formed? So he was born in the small town of Brewer, Maine, a thousand people. His parents were deeply religious. He, from an early age, had an intellectual curiosity which was then enhanced by going to Bowdoin College. Five days horseback ride north of Harvard, we needed a college in Maine. And there he had a classical education. And uh, classical education was really a character education about values, duty, uh, loyalty, uh, magnanimity. And, And this, I think, really shaped who he was. So he combined both this classical education and his Christian upbringing to make him a person, I think, of real character. And that's what I think shines through in all the various vocations of his life. Now, was he was he maybe a was he a mild mannered guy? What was his personality like? Yeah. One reason I use the title uh, unlikely is he was mild mannered, amiable, good humored. He actually came to the college with a great deficit. He was a stutterer or a stammerer. And this really was difficult in a very oral culture where much of the education was by recitation. So this is what makes him unlikely to suddenly be this fearless soldier in the Civil War. This is not what anyone would have predicted knowing him as a young man. Yeah. And, you know, that's a very, it's, it's, this is a very interesting figure to, to read about, actually, because one of the, the patterns on this show that that emerges often is all these people who, you know, nobody, nobody completely plans for a war and it just happens. And the people who are there are the people who are there. So these people who are maybe not suited, you know, you don't think about, you know, this, this stam- stammering um, kind of bookish type figure as being like a, a warrior. Um, but it's often the result of people who are thrown in these situations so I believe he was, what, what was his, his vocation? Uh, what, what was he planning to do before well, the war a, came? a big question. When he graduated from Bowdoin College, his parents had quite different visions for his future. His father wanted him to go to West Point. And in those days, you would, could go to West Point after you graduated from college. His mother wanted him to be a minister or a missionary. And the untold story I discovered was that he accepted her advice his own decision, and he went to Bangor Theological Seminary for three years. But because he never became a minister, those three years have been relegated to two sentences in the previous biographies. But I argue that those three years were also part of his formation. My problem was that the seminary, founded in 1814, went out of business in 2013. Fortunately, I could find the records. They were put into the Maine Historical Society, and I arrived just after they'd been cataloged. So this is who he thought he might be. But as he graduated, he was offered the chance to give a speech at the Bowdoin commencement, which would then give him a Master of Arts degree. And the speech was so remarkable, I guess, that 
The next morning, they offered him a teaching position. That's what he was doing when the Civil War broke out. And, you know, that's, that's very interesting that his father wanted him to go to West Point and his mother wanted him to be a minister, and he chose to, to be a minister. Yet later on, of course, he would go into the war. What was, it is very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Do we know anything about kind of the, 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 his decision-making at that time, why he chose the path of being a minister? Was his family disappointed that he took that path? Did he have a tense relationship with, with his father because of it? What, what do we know about the decision-making around that? I think he had a closer relationship to his mother than his father. I wouldn't say that was the reason he chose to go to seminary. I think he wasn't really sure what he wanted to do. And so he, he tried this out and thought he might do that. But then he also enters into a relationship with Fanny Francis Caroline Adams, who was not sure she wanted to be a minister's wife. She was very sure she didn't want to be a missionary's wife. <laughs> Yeah, well, let's 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 talk about uh, Fanny. What what was the? How did that relationship get started? Uh, what was, what brought them together, and um, how did their lives start? Well, when I do a biography, I often begin by understanding or understand quickly there are pieces of a puzzle, and a key piece of the puzzle was Fanny. How to understand her? She had been born into a family in Boston, the seventh child. Her father was 50 years old, old enough to be her grandfather. And they did something in the 19th century extremely surprising to us today. When she was four, he literally gave her to his younger cousin, George Adams, who was in his 20s, pastor of First Parish in Brunswick, Maine. So that's where she grew up. She was the uh, uh, organist or pianist in the choir of the church, and he sang in the choir, and that's how they met. Bowdoin College was for men. She did not go to college, but she's a very high-spirited person. And if I could, I'd like to just read this one little excerpt about Fanny. This just says so much to me about her character, who she really was, and this is really an amazing story. As a high school girl, maybe 17 years of age, she was noted for her very spirited wit and humor. And one day her teacher, Alfred Pike, gave an assignment. He wanted the students to compose a paper ending with the word, verbs ending in F-Y, F-Y. Now she knew that Mr. Pike did not entirely approve of her humor. So this is what she wrote. This is to certify, notify, exemplify, testify, and signify my obedient disposition. And I hope that it will gratify, satisfy, beautify, and edify my teacher, and pacify, modify, and nullify his feelings of dissatisfaction towards me. Please do not exclaim, oh, fie, when reading this paper. I just think that story tells you a lot about her spirit as a young woman. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for reading that. Um, you're absolutely right. And you know, I wonder. I wonder how then. How did they complement each other? Was he very, very quiet and maybe not so, um, as you put it, high spirited? What, what was that? What was what was their dynamic like? Well, another dissimilarity which bothered her at first was she was three years older than he. And in the 19th century, at this point in time, most marriages would consist of a man being six years older than the woman. So she was very high spirited. She was into art, painting. She was into music. He was a more serious person. I wouldn't necessarily say he was a sober person, but they did have different abilities and different interests. But sometimes those differences attract each other. Yeah. Well, so they've, they've found each other. They are two people who have, have gotten married, um, how do they start their lives? What are they What are they hoping for? Well, he's a teacher, a professor at Bowdoin College. And then in uh, April 61, the Civil War breaks out. Uh, there were no electives in colleges at that time. So I, I, I think Chamberlain would have known every single person, student who had enlisted in the Union Army, two actually enlisted in the Confederate Army. And John Cross, the Confederate, the alumni secretary at Bowdoin College has been a great help to me in tracking down every one of these soldiers. So 
Chamberlain is conversing, uh, corresponding with some of them. He knows when they've been captured. Several have been killed. And then in 1862, Lincoln offers a proclamation that we need 300,000 more men. And in 13 days, Chamberlain writes to the governor of Maine and volunteers his service. Well, what was, I guess, thinking about kind of the lead up to the war, and this is always just such a, a fascinating period to me, is the lead up to the Civil War. Just kind of trying to put my myself in the place of, one, actually, one of the reasons why I like your books is it is very easy for me to put myself in the place of the people you write about, which I enjoy. But thinking about like the lead up and trying to put myself in the place of of normal Americans and the calculations they're making, the things they're worried about, what they're following in the, the newspaper. So he's, he's in Maine. Um, leading up to the Civil War, what's most likely in his community? What's the discussion like? What politically are people worried about and, and talking about? And, and what does he believe politically? Well, a help to me here was a, a young man whose father ran the hardware store in Brunswick has kept a journal. And what people are talking about is the union. I think it's very hard for us today to really get our minds around this concept. It wasn't simply a political concept. It was almost a religious concept, certainly a transcendent concept. So they weren't really talking about slavery in, in Maine. They were talking about the Union. And this is why men joined up so readily, so quickly, to defend the Union. And this was a far northern state, a New England state, and the sense of the Union was very, very strong among them. That was the impetus for signing up. And do we have any evidence that uh, that Chamberlain was himself, did, was he outspoken about union? Did he make political statements? What, what do we know about his mindset? There's a wonderful file in the Bowdoin College Library, which he put together himself, where he called it, My Little Speeches on the War. So in that first year of the war, he spoke quite often. He was an elegant speaker. Here again is the unlikeliness. Here's this boy who comes to the College of Stammerer. Now he's professor of rhetoric at Bowdoin. And so he spoke about the, the one wonder of, of the Union. And finally, when he signs up, his motivation, as he says to the governor, is he said, it's very important that men like me who have positions are willing to give up what they have. He saw this war being fought mostly by boys by very, very young men, you know, teenagers. But now he, at age 33, believes that people of his place need to sign up. No one would have criticized him with a wife and two young children for not signing up. But this was his impetus to sign up. Yeah. Well, you know, just kind of thinking about your other books about Grant and Lincoln, I think we could probably say that they were unlikely heroes. Yeah. yeah. Do you is that part of the fast is that part of the fascination that you have with 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 Chamberlain or just characters that you like to do biographies about in general? Well, when I did my biography of Lincoln, uh, I was working at the Huntington Library in San Reno, California, and the director of research said, "Do we need another biography of Lincoln?" So we knew a lot about Lincoln. We thought. Grant was one I thought, along with others, needed to be kind of uh, recalibrated to be often to have a fresh picture of him. He had been put down as a as a scandal person in the presidency, as a as a, as a person in the Civil War who was heedless of men's lives. No, I really didn't think of them so much as unlikely. Certainly, I thought of Chamberlain as unlikely as I got to know him. I've lived with him for six years. Sometimes I wake up at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And thinking about Chamberlain. And then I decided that he really is a very unlikely person. Let's talk about Chamberlain the soldier. So how did he come to join the Union Army? When did he join? You, you mentioned a little bit about how there was this call in, in Maine. And he, he joined up very quickly. What did his family think? What, 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 was, what was going on in the moment that he decided it's time for me to enter this war? Those are the questions I asked myself. Uh, when he joined the governor, uh, they were looking, governors of all the states were looking for eminent persons who had the ability to, uh, to uh, recruit a thousand men in a regiment. So he offered Chamberlain a colonelcy. 
And I'm sure the governor was surprised when Chamberlain said, no, I have to turn that down. I don't deserve a colonelcy. I don't have any military training. He said, I will start at a lower rank. And then in this wonderful words, he said to the governor, I want to learn and earn my way to a higher rank. So he starts out under another great main figure, as it turns out, Adelbert Ames, who's 26 years old, a graduate of West Point. Ames takes over the 20th Maine leadership and the men hate him because he's a strict disciplinarian. Some of them write, they hope he will be the first casualty when they face the Confederates. But Chamberlain did not hate him. They're seven years older than Ames. He knows he has a lot to learn about military discipline, military strategy. So the teacher becomes the learner. And again, I think that says a lot about him. He's willing to be the learner, knowing what he does not know. That says a lot about his first months, really almost first year of the Civil War. And what does his family think when, you know, this kind of bookish uh, professor, this teacher, yeah. is all of a sudden going to become an officer? This is the firstborn, the eldest son. They're very concerned. The father even had some uh, kind of almost pro-Confederate thoughts. It's very hard to remember how much the Confederacy was popular in many places within yeah, the city. All the way up in Maine. And all the way up in Maine, in, mm -hmm. in obviously New York, in Boston. The controversy is what did his wife Fanny think? Now at the very, almost the end of his life, Chamberlain hired a very young woman to be his secretary in the early 20th century. In 1976, now not a young woman, she gives an interview in which she says, well, his wife did not want him to go off to the Civil War. Well, there's no evidence for that. She had never met Fanny. Fanny was dead by the time she was hired as his secretary. But that's been repeated over and over and over again. Any wife would be worried about her husband's his injury or his possible death. He's the father of their children. So we don't fully know, but I find no evidence that she is against what he's doing. She certainly would be concerned about what he's doing. Yeah. Well, first, uh, I always think it's interesting when I hear about people recently, I mean, I guess the 70s, maybe not, not so recent, but recent enough who um, have connections to that time period. There's an article in The Atlantic recently about James Longstreet. And I guess his second, his second wife was like 40 yeah. or 50 years younger than him. And she was amazing. Yeah. And she was like giving interviews in like the sixties or the seventies, just about him. Uh, and, and she lived quite a long life, but I think that's, it's very interesting to hear about people recently who have a perspective like that. But thinking about um, Chamberlain and, and, and his family, you know, I wonder if, you know, his father wanted him to go to West Point, but now, like, he's hesitating um, to see his son leave. I, I wonder if that, we're at 1862 now, is, does, is it because the Union is losing so badly that maybe there are hesitations? Or I'm not sure if we could even characterize as losing so badly, but definitely losing uh, right now. Is it just, is it a fight that people think the Union aren't going to win? Well, that's part of it. But then, interestingly, once he is in, Chamberlain is in, his father becomes proud of him and believes that there's kind of almost a lucky star that follows the eldest son. The, the couple of the younger sons will ultimately die of tuberculosis, but the youngest son, Tom, also signs up to serve with Chamberlain with the older son. So now there's a pride in him. And in this journal that I discovered in this town of Brunswick, the, general, the young man writes in it about Chamberlain several times because the town knows who he is and they are proud that he is, he is leading the 20th. He is, by Gettysburg, he is leading the 20th Maine. Adelbert Ames has now been promoted to another position. Yeah, well, so Chamberlain joins. Um, he's now in, in an officer role. Uh, I believe he gets shipped out uh, to Virginia. Yes. And um, something interesting that I that you you write about is, and I forget 
it's again, like it's, it's so fun to, it's fun and interesting to put myself in the position of somebody back at this time. But most, you write, most of the, the soldiers from Maine had never actually left the state. And so getting to Virginia, it's, it almost feels, it seems like it's like a foreign country. That's a good cop. It is a foreign country to these men. They're not prepared for what they experience. The weather is completely different. The terrain is completely different. The people, they've never really been around African-Americans before. Now they meet, see and see them in, in Virginia. Yeah, it's a very new experience for them. Yeah. Is that now, is that specific, you think, just to Maine? Because it's so kind of, I don't know if remote is the right word, but further away than, say, you know, Pennsylvania. Do, are most people at this point in history, do they not leave their states? Are they encountering all sorts of, of new types of people? Yes, it's easy to forget that for most people, most, yes, take young men, they are born, married, live, work, and die in the same town, as did their fathers and their mothers. There isn't this, the mobility that we just take for granted today. So what are some of the things that like a soldier from Maine is going to encounter uh, a soldier from Virginia or Northern Virginia, the, whatever is like the southernmost point of the Union entry? Um, what are some of the differences that, that might be between those two types of soldiers? Well, first of all, the clothing they're wearing is not at all appropriate for arriving in Virginia in the middle of the summer. They have never experienced this kind of heat and humidity in Virginia. Then suddenly they're in, a, in a, a terrain where people are not applauding them, not cheering them on as when they first arrived in Boston and they're great heroes going south. Now they're among people who are not pleased at all that they're there and they can't tell really who are, who are the for and who is, who is the against. And the problem often at night or in certain places of bushwhacking taking place by men who simply appear to be farmers during the day, but are Confederate sympathizers at night. So it's a whole new situation, much more tumultuous than they ever expected. And what are some of Chamberlain's thoughts, maybe leading up to like his first, the first action he sees? What are some of his thoughts about being a new soldier and being in, in a foreign land? Well, foreign land, quote, quote, unquote. Part of his thoughts, and he's kind of reluctant to share these with Fanny. He's very circumspect about what he writes to her is the danger involved and the question i think in the mind and heart of every soldier what will he do when he's faced with someone firing at him and to i think chamberlain's own surprise and to the admiration of his men he seems to be absolutely courageous in terms of not flinching not going back and he watches as other men do they're they're frightened understandably in this new situation so he emerges rather quickly, and it's not simply that somebody has said this at the end, you know, in Killer Angels, but there's all kinds of testimonies from letters and journals of the men in his 20th Maine who really regard him with great, with great appreciation. Yeah. Well, when he first sees action, where do you think that, that this courage comes from? I, I believe he pretty quickly gets his horse shot out from under him. Where, where, where do you think this school teacher, uh, well, school teacher, this teacher, where do you think this courage comes from? Well, I like to think to myself that, that in this spontaneity, as you describe it correctly, it really, there's a foundation to it. It really comes all the way back to the values that have been a part of your life growing up. I kind of ask myself the question, I don't know the full story, what made the firemen rush into the Cathedral of Notre Dame? in the midst of that raging fire spontaneously and take all of these precious elements right back out. So I think it's really his commitment to duty, uh, his affection for his fellow soldiers. These are the values that I think will finally come to the fore. They might have been latent values before, but they come to the fore in the midst of the Civil War. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about um, up to Gettysburg. Um, because Get Gettysburg is, is, I don't want to say the main event, but that's, that's the, the, the big battle. What, what types of battles is Chamberlain involved in leading up to, to Gettysburg? What happens to him in, in those battles? What's, what's, how's his role evolving as an officer? 
Well, the 20th Maine arrives on the, at the beginning of the second day, July 2nd. And uh, he receives a command from Strong Vincent, the brigade commander. You are to defend the far left line. Hold it at all costs. And I should inject here that Chamberlain's life, as he's become this great hero, is not without controversy. So there's even controversy about what did he actually do? What did he actually say at Gettysburg? Some have said, well, Strong Vincent deserves more credit. But Chamberlain gives Strong Vincent credit. Strong Vincent will be killed in the midst of the battle for Little Round Top. So he is given the command to defend the far left line. Now his thousand man main 20th regiment is less than 500 men. All kinds of deaths, desertions, lots of different ideas. He's facing a force twice his size, almost twice his size, basically the 15th Alabama led by William Calvin Oates, although there are Texas regiments coming up a little round top also. And actually, real quick, could we, to give context for the audience uh, who might not be so familiar with Gettysburg itself, um, could you briefly describe like why this battle is taking place here, the, the, the situation, the leadership? Could you describe the, the bigger picture real quick? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, no one expected it to take place here. This is a market town. Uh, just a few miles north of the Maryland border, uh, 10 or 11 roads come into Gettysburg. And in a kind of almost chance happening, uh, Confederates and Union soldiers fire on each other. And suddenly 160,000 men, the two armies meet together. One of the, again, the ironies of this is that the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> Confederates are coming in from the north <laughs> The Union soldiers are coming in from the south. And so suddenly this is joined. Robert E. Lee has believed that if he could make an invasion into the north, this would perhaps make the north want to sue for peace, that he could change the 1864 presidential election, and that Lincoln is now being called Lincoln's War. Lincoln would be defeated in that bid for re-election. So this is the far northern push of the Confederate Army. And on the first day, they're quite successful. They have more men in place in the first day than the Union Army does. But then on the morning of the second day, Governor Warren takes his spy glasses, his field glasses, looks up at Little Round Top and realizes that this place is not being defended. And if the Confederates could get to the top of Little Round Top, they would then have, in a sense, the high ground they would be able to be in a commanding position. So suddenly it's imperative that the Northern Union Army mount Little Round Top to be in a deficient position to defend the far left line of the Union Army. And the stakes are that if if the Confederate Army succeeds at Gettysburg, then they're going to come down from the north and encircle Washington, D.C., correct? Absolutely. No, that then it's not simply Gettysburg, but but Washington, D.C., I mean, today you can drive from Washington, D.C. to Gettysburg in an hour and a half. It's not that far. Yeah. This would have threatened the, the, the capital of the nation. Yeah. And so uh, leading up to Gettysburg, uh, what kind of how do people know um, Chamberlain? What is what's the action he's seen so far? What's his reputation once he arrives and he's now entrusted to lead soldiers in this massive battle? Well, up to this point in time, at several places, Antietam, Fredericksburg, the 20th Maine has not really been involved. They've been held in reserve. They've watched. They've been involved in a number of skirmishes. Uh, Chamberlain has had several horses shot out from under him, but they've never been in a major battle. And so it's not at all clear how will the 20th Maine do, how will Chamberlain lead, And this is what makes the drama of the whole event so huge. This is in some ways the first major battle for the 20th Maine. Well, let's let's talk about um, the 20th Maine and their experience in Gettysburg. What what happens? What how, how do they contribute to the Union victory? Well, they are. At the top of Little Round Top, uh, there's they're defending the far left line and suddenly the 15th Alabama, led by William Calvin Oates, starts coming up through the boulders and the trees. 
The problem for the 20th Maine is they've literally run out of ammunition. And so what will they do at this point? Again, it's kind of a controversy through history and memory. What did Chamberlain actually say? I think he probably said only one word, bayonet. And the bayonets, which are not used often at all in Civil War, suddenly this becomes the basis of their charge down the hill. They rout the Confederates, capture some, others flee, and it's recognized right away. Adelbert Ames, who I brought up as the commander originally of the 20th Maine, writes Chamberlain the very next day, July 3rd, to congratulate him on the significant victory. So it was understood at the time. This is not some retrospective uh, perceptive perception of what took place. And do we know, did Chamberlain write about how he felt in that moment? Do we know what was going through his head? He's been, he's a courageous man, of course. How is he, I mean, obviously you're leading a bayonet charge down a hill. That's a scary thing. Do we know how he was feeling in that moment? Well, he wrote to his wife and it's interesting the way he conducted or wrote this letter. At first, he says to her, in effect, this was a great moment and I was there leading us. And then I think it's almost like he pauses, looks at what he wrote, and this thought, this sounds a little presumptuous or arrogant. And then he literally says, but I don't mean to say that. So he's trying to modify what he's saying. He doesn't want to give all the credit to himself. He wants her to know, really, the credit belongs to the men of his regiment who were so courageous at that moment. Now, thinking about kind of the tactics of this, uh, of this charge, why do you think, why do you think it was successful and something like the very infamous Pickett's charge was not successful? Well, it took the Confederates by surprise, first of all, and, uh, and they had the advantage. They had less men, but they had the advantage of taking the initiative, catching the Confederates by surprise. I think that was a big part of it. Pickett's charge is a completely different story. Yeah, yeah. Well, so Gettysburg is, you know, it's a victory for the Union, but major losses, uh, as you as you noted. How is how is how is Chamberlain when the battle when the dust settles? What's what's what role has he stepped into? How is he being regarded by his colleagues? and the leadership in the Union Army. After, after Gettysburg, he has, in a certain sense, established his role. There's even a, a movement to, uh, to, to nominate him to become a general. And he's got a number of people who write on his behalf, some really remarkable letters. And yet, in the way that this sometimes happened in the Civil War, he does not receive the promotion to general. Lincoln ultimately makes that decision. We're not quite sure why that happened. Uh, maybe Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, had a role in this, and maybe there had some intramural turmoil between Stanton and the people who recommended him. We don't know. So we, we move forward then in, in the battles. Chamberlain several times is so badly, not even simply wounded, but ill. One time it's malaria that he will go back to Brunswick once, twice. And his mother says to him, don't you think you've now done enough? And of course, he signed up for three years. And he's, again, his sense of duty says, no, I've made this decision and I must continue and follow through with it. Well, what, how does, how does he, so the war ends, he's kind of this, as you write, unlikely soldier. He's a teacher who becomes a soldier or an officer. He's fought in this huge battle of the war. He's demonstrated his own heroism. How does he think of himself by the time the war ends? What's his own self-perception? Well, he is known as the hero of Little Round Top. But then on top of that, two other events in the Civil War really mark who he is. At Petersburg, 10 months after Gettysburg, he is leading a charge when he is hit by a mini ball that goes into his right hip, uh, shatters blood vessels, scrapes his urethra and bladder, and stays at in, out, inside his left hip. He is told by two surgeons who come upon him that he will die. 
Today, um, modern physicians would say he has a 10% chance of surviving such a wound. He writes a remarkable letter to Fanny telling her that he is mortally wounded, that he loves her, confesses his Christian faith, tells her to live for the children. But then younger brother Tom rushes over to the 20th Maine and finds two physicians there. They come over to Chamberlain. They remove, they find and remove the bullet. But for the rest of his life, he lives with what today we would call invisible wounds. We're very familiar with the amputations that were a mark of the Civil War. But Chamberlain three times has surgery to repair this awful wound, but it cannot really be repaired. And for the rest of his life, he will live with the wound and the infections from the wound. But mm. then 10 months later, just to complete the Civil War story, he is given the order to lead the surrender of Union troops off receiving the surrender of the Confederate troops. Again, part of the controversy. There's no written order. And yet my tutor, teacher, friend, Jim McPherson, our greatest Civil War historian, said, hey, at the end of the Civil War, not everything was written down. So John B. Gordon, who is written in Lee's esteem, brings forward the Confederate soldiers at Appomattox. Lee and Grant have left. Grant has offered this magnanimous peace offer to Lee. I think Chamberlain must have been thinking about this. And so as the Confederate soldiers come forward, he offers what's called the marching salute. It's not to the cause, but it's to the courage of the Confederate soldiers. And Gordon leading the Confederate soldiers is just astonished at this and would remark then and 30 years later in a book he writes about this remarkable gesture of Chamberlain. Does uh, does Chamberlain have, by the time the war ends, does he does he feel like, again, this kind of like quiet bookish guy, does he recognize his own contributions to the success of the Union? He does. And, and what has come through to me, and I've thought about this in terms of, say, World War II, my wife's father was in Patton's Third Army, that for many of these men, very, very young, this is almost, the, this is the defining moment of their life. And for a lot of them, it's kind of a struggle afterward. Well, now what do I do? I mean, they fought in this great war. They've had this terrific comradeship. They've been here, her, hailed as heroes. So Chamberlain isn't exactly sure what is he going to do after the war. But then the Republican Party of Maine comes forward. They recognize that he is the hero of Little Round Top. And they nominated him to become the governor of Maine. Yeah, well, I was just about to ask about some of his post-war contributions. Um, what's what's Chamberlain well known for after the war? Well, I argue that he is serves more different vocations than any other Civil War veteran. Now, he's not president of the United States like Ulysses S. Grant, but he becomes first governor, elected four times. Now, the term was just one year, but still. Very, very unusual, four times. Then he becomes president of Bowdoin College for 12 years. Then he becomes a great lecturer. And then there is no pension, a small military pension, uh, not a pension from governor, not a pension from president. He tries his hand in business. And as his son Willies will say at the end of the 19th century, our man can't be successful in everything. <laughs> <laughs> and he was not very successful in business. That's very interesting. I think there is, I think similar, I think there's something with Grant where he was like a tanner or he tried to be a tanner or something. But right, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, what, what, what has he, now that he's seen the horrors of war, you know, he's obviously, he's public service is important to him. He's governor, um, he's lecturing. What, what's he kind of making his, his mission in these post-war years? Well, he's very worried that the, 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 the memory of the war is disappearing quickly. Abraham Lincoln wrote as a young man, the silent artillery of time is taking away all those who fought in the Revolutionary War. Uh, Pearl Harbor this year had just a very few men who came in over 100 years of age. So he's worried that we're losing our vision and our understanding of why we fought this war. So part of his, what becomes a controversial move is that he initiates at Bowdoin College what's called the drill, which becomes the drill rebellion. 
he thinks young men in the 1870s and 1880s are soft and that we need to harden them so that if another war comes, they will be prepared. So his vision is also to continue to talk about the union, talk about the meaning of America, and he's eloquent in doing so. Yeah, well, I think you uh, you mentioned that you have a, a reading from uh, yeah. Chamberlain and Augusta. Yeah, yeah. Another un- unlikely event that occurred, we, we think that the uh, uh, peaceful transfer of power we always assumed was just a, a given in our society until January 6th. But actually, that peaceful transfer of power had a previous uh, story that was not so peaceful. Uh, in 1879, <clears throat> the Republicans believe they have won a great election to be governor of Maine, lead, control the House of Representatives, control the, House, the Senate. And then the great count out begins. And the Secretary of State in receiving the ballots counts out, well, this ballot was signed with initials, not full names. Those five votes don't count. Oh, this ballot was signed on one column, not two. Those seven votes don't count. Oh, this ballot was not signed in an open meeting. Oh, those votes don't count. And suddenly the Republicans who thought they were in the lead and about to win the election are in third place. There's also a Greenback Party. Well, the state of Maine's constitution is that if there's two parties in the lead, the House will decide which which will be the parties and the Senate will decide which will be the governor. So this provokes incredible anger across the state. Men begin marching to Augusta, the state capital, fully armed. And interestingly, the the Democratic governor believes there's only one person who can handle the situation. He calls upon Chamberlain, president of Bowdoin College, to come to Augusta, and he does. And once he gets there, he realizes that his own life is a threat. People are talking about kidnapping him or killing him. Republicans are saying that he is a traitor to their cause because he is not standing up for them in the way they think he should. So in a very dramatic moment, and let me read this for you, he comes to the rotunda of the Capitol, as we can only call it an insurgency, is about to take place, and he says these words. Men, you wish to kill me. Killing is no new thing to me. I've offered myself to be killed many times when I no more deserved it than now. Some of you, I think, have been there with me in those days. You understand what you want, do you? I'm here to preserve the peace and honor of this state until the right government is seated. Whichever it may be, it's not for me to say, but it is for me to see that the laws of this state are put into effect without fraud, without force but with calm thought and sincere purpose. I am here for that, and I shall do it. If anybody wants to kill me for it, here I am, let him kill. And with that, he opens his coat in kind of a dramatic gesture. Wow. Well, just at that moment, a veteran in the crowd calls out, by God, old general, the first man that dares to lay a hand on you, I'll kill him on the spot. And the crowd drifted away. So here is another example in American history, not well known, where the peaceful of transfer of power is not about to take place. I think this is Chamberlain's finest moment. Interestingly, he writes to Fanny the next day, this was a second little round top, a second little round top. What ultimately happens is the state Supreme Court uh, offers its verdict. The Republican did win the governorship. The Republicans did win the House. They did win the Senate. And Chamberlain becomes a hero, just esteemed by people all across the the, the nation and and, and, and words. This is how he is viewed. Dennis Shapley, remembering his participation in the surrender at Appomattox, wrote, General Chamberlain, we were never so proud of you as now, not even when you stood upon the boundary lines and received the surrender of our vanquished brave foe. So I believe this story deserves its place alongside the story of Little Round Top. Wow, that is a very, that is a powerful story. A powerful story. Uh, yeah, well, if you know a few things about that. First, 
it's very interesting that he he opened his speech talking about killing and and death and you get the you get the sense that not maybe maybe not just with Chamberlain but most of the veterans of the war you know n- nobody was prepared to see this enormous slaughter that nope. happened and you really wonder how that how that changed Chamberlain and and how he viewed life and and I think it's very interesting in that speech that he starts talking about how much death he has seen and how much killing he has seen in asking the crowd, you know, is that what you want? Because I've seen that and I know what that's like. So that's very interesting. Also very interesting that it seems like by this point in Chamberlain's life, he's not, he's maybe not this, this quiet person anymore. No, good point. Very good comment. I think so many people I believe have sort of latent qualities and it's often a crisis that brings out the full measure of those qualities and how people then respond to that crisis, the crisis of the Civil War. In his, this case, the crisis of almost a stolen election in his home state, which he loved deeply. So now he's willing to step forward and offer this speech. He certainly probably wasn't prepared to do that 20 years before. But, and and, and he, he's faced death in the Civil War. He's willing to face death to defend what he thinks are the values of his state. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, um, especially when it comes to writing biographies about uh, people who are who are courageous and lead extraordinary lives. I'm curious how you, the writer, how would you say you changed from when you started this project to when you finished it? Well, it's wonderful to try to be a companion to these kinds of people. You'd like to think that some of their values might rub off a little bit. You know, I, I just, uh, I, 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 I'm asked the question often, well, who are the leaders of today that embody these values? And I must admit, I have to have a long pause in trying to answer that question. But also the other side of that question is, well, who are we? What kind of leaders do we want? What kind of leaders do we demand? And I think in the after effect of the 12 days of 1880 was all of these people who wrote about Chamberlain, what they were really saying is that these are the values we need today in our society, today being 1880. And so I end my book by arguing that this is not simply a 19th century story. It's not simply a civil war story. But I think Chamberlain has a lot to say to us today about the values that we want in us, in each of us as individuals, but certainly in the leaders that we elect. Yeah. Well, you, you the, the title of your book is On Great Fields. One of the first the question is, why is it called that? And then I think if, if you wouldn't mind, you've got a, a third reading uh, that talks about where that that phrase comes from. And then maybe just finish out by talking about, you know, what what's important about Joshua Chamberlain's life. Um, what what would, should we all remember him for? Well, thank you. I give credit to my editor, Caitlin <laughs> McKenna, who came up with the title. <laughs> all right. Shout out to the editor. Yeah. But the title, as you suggest, comes from Chamberlain's most famous words. In 1889, the 20th Maine, the, those who still lived, went back to Gettysburg to dedicate monuments to both Little Round Top and Big Round Top. And at Gettysburg in 1889, Chamberlain said these words, in great deeds, something abides. On great fields, something stays. Forms change and pass. Bodies disappear, but spirits linger to consecrate ground for the vision place of souls. Generations that know us not, and that we know not of, heart drawn to see where and by whom great things were suffered and done for them, shall come to this deathless field to ponder and dream. So Chamberlain is not simply to be known for what he did, but what he said. I I say in the book, if you were to ask him in the 1880s, what's the most valuable thing, the most important thing you've done. I don't think he would have answered uh, governor of Maine, president of Bowdoin College. He was a remarkable speaker. And so I spend a whole chapter trying to understand the content of those speeches. 
And those speeches can still speak to us today. As we speak, there's a $10 million renovation going on at Gettysburg, a two-year renovation. It'll finally be open again in, September, in the spring of 2024 because of the crowds coming to Little Round Top, the foot traffic, the car traffic, the bus traffic. People want to see this person. So again, the question becomes, what is a hero? What background? What qualities? What influences? And I want to really just turn that question over to my readers and to your audience to try to answer for each of us that question today. Wow. A, a powerful thing to end on. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, what, uh, Ron, what are you working on next? Well, I'm working next uh, on what I call uh, unprecedented, the third act of John Quincy Adams. In all of our 46 presidents, only one returned to serve in political office. Uh, 17 years, John Quincy Adams, who was smashed in the 1828 election by Andrew Jackson, who'd had a long career as a diplomat, secretary of state, president, believes he's going to return home to Massachusetts, uh, write the biography of his famous father. He's tired of politics, tired of the criticism that he received as president. And yet Edward Everett, who the great speaker, who was president of Harvard, said, you ought to run for Congress. And in 1860, at age 64, he begins a 17-year career in Congress until his death in, at age 81. I think these are the finest 17 years. And there's a new organization out called The Third Act. And it's asking for people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, you have much left to contribute to society. I think John Quincy Adams is a poster child for the third act. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you can, if you can, um, if you can handle Congress, I guess when you're, you should be, you know, <laughs> that, that seems like a stressful way to, to end out life. So God bless him for for. So he took on the slaveocracy. He defended the slaves in the in the ship uh, Amistad. He did remarkable things, more important than his four years as president for his term in Congress. Terms. Well, in Congress. Ron, yeah. well, Ron, if if people want to um, learn about your book, stay in touch with what you're doing. Um, where can they find you? Are you on social media? Do you do you have a website? I'm on social media. My website is uh, www.ronaldcwhite.com. Wonderful. Well. Uh, Ronald C. White on Great Fields, The Life and Unlikely Heroism of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Um, go pick up a copy. Go check it out from your library um, because it's a really fascinating tale. And um, Ron, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.